Hey, welcome in everybody to the Sports Fanatic News Hockey Show as I am joined by a very special guest today. It's been a while. I'm joined by Anthony Sardelli. He was on with Pirlo and I before and now we're back to catch up with the California teams and who we think is going to end up taking the they have a Pennsylvania Cup in the AHL. So I call it the California quote unquote cup. Uh, in hockey and who even if they don't make the playoffs will beat out all the rest of the California team we'll start with Delhi's favorite team give me a couple thoughts you have on the Anaheim Ducks this far this year yeah I mean so far it's been inconsistent you talk about the, the Pennsylvania Cup what about the California burrito who's going to take home the California <laughs> so uh the Ducks it's just hard to tell the Ducks have been inconsistent not just from game to game but from period to period I mean They'll come out. Second period has been their best, really, over the over the start of the season. And the other night, they came out against the Sharks and and had a great first period, took the lead, and then just laid an absolute stinker in the second period. So the Ducks are really struggling to put a full game together, and that's reflected in standings as of now. I mean, you could say they're still in the hunt, but in terms of point percentage, which is what you're looking at when all these games are are being played, kind of not consistent throughout the season, they're kind of near the bottom. But uh, it's still of the California teams. They seem to be the me to me to be bleh, excuse me to me to be the most consistent. The Kings uh, got off to a slow start. They're kind of struggling now. They're doing all right with their scoring numbers, but defense potential can be the show. They're struggling with injury. I think if we're talking best California team by the end of the season, down to the Sharks and Ducks because the Sharks really had a, a, a kind of a bad hand dealt to them at the kick their home games. Uh, they still haven't figured out that Martin Jones is not a starting goalie. So I think once San Jose has had some more uh, home games in their home arena, and once they give Devin Dubnik playing time, they're going to challenge the Ducks for that top team in California. Will they make the playoffs, any of them? That's still that's still a tough one to decide. Yeah, uh, it's interesting with the Sharks because I wrote an article for um, OT on it in the offseason where, one, you got Dubnik, who's outperforming Martin Jones, who has 0-3 because of the same way a pitcher is 0-3 when he has like a 2-5 ERA in baseball. It's not because he's he's doing – but he did bad in the first game he got put in. Don't get me wrong. That game he did look very shaky. But past that, he actually has made a lot of key saves for them. Jones has been a lot more inconsistent. And for some reason, they're like, let's just run Martin Jones into the ground and hope for the best. They also have Melnichuk in the minors who has looked good coming over. And he's a guy that has got forced into a game because of how bad uh, Marty did in the one game. And he's a guy that I think has a chance to at least be a B, meaning like how the Reimer Morazic kind of duo is there where he could at least be to their level where, you should give him time eventually if Jonesy just really, really, really can't figure it out. I understand his contract, but sometimes you can't look at things in money. You got to look at things in what's best for your team. And if Martin Jones keeps struggling, even at the value he's getting, you're better off just saying, hey, if you get picked up on waivers, so be it. If not, we're going to put you down. Hope you can kind of figure it out down there. And we'll roll with Dubnik and Melnichuk because he already, in my opinion, can be a backup. You shouldn't start. You, there's no chance you should call him up and say you're starting over Devin Dubnik. That would also be a mistake. But if he backs up Devin Dubnik, I think you can go from there. I would say give Jones another week. If it's still looking bad, you probably want to make a move there. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't understand what Bob Budner is doing, Jones. I mean, you played 14 games. You started him in, what, 10? Or he's, he's come in 10, in yeah. 10 total. But he's got a... a Point, an 873 save percentage and a 3.75 goals against. Now, I'm not I'm not that good at uh, – I mean, I know these are regular metrics, regular stats for goalies, and they shouldn't always be judged that way. I'm not great at interpreting advanced stats for goalies, but an 873 save percentage is just terrible. Like, that's that's got to be one of the worst – maybe the worst save percentages in the league starting goalie. So I don't understand why he can't give Nick a little more opportunity. Yeah, I would definitely, I would say also Dubnik's a guy, obviously when he's at his best, he's a huge guy that takes up the net. He brings that presence that I feel like, obviously I don't know this, but I feel like a guy that Leonard might have looked to to learn from is probably Devin Dubnik because they're both huge guys that take up the net well. Jones is a pretty big, big guy himself at 6'4", but just um, a smaller guy in terms of stature where 
he more wor- works on his actually being key with technique and everything where Dubnik can get away with sloppy technique at times because he's just massive and somehow will hit the damn puck. Um, so I think the best strategy for them is definitely if you want to roll with Jones, figure it out, feel it out for another week. If it ain't working, you got to start Dubnik. I would give um, Melnichuk the uh, shot there because he just seems like a guy that's going to actually be solid. Obviously, when he came in, he did okay in a short stint, similar to how Ottinger did good in a short stint in last year's playoffs, of all things, when he had to get forced in. So I think it's a um, pretty good idea just to roll with those two if they keep struggling there, because I see the Sharks' biggest Achilles heel is, well, number one, their goaltending, and number two, the fact that their defense has a lot of guys that shouldn't be playing as many minutes that are playing a crap ton of minutes just because they have no – depth and now you obviously have Simic, you have Carlson uh out. Um so I think uh having that um Carlson's apparently day to day, but still having them out for a couple of days is a big loss, even with his struggle in play, because it's just a presence on the ice. You don't look at Frederick Cleason and Nicholas Maloche and go, Yeah, okay, these are guys that I fear. Like like they never had that past stature where at least Carlson still has that past stature, even though Burns, who's 35, is out playing. But you still have the stature, and that's something that they need in that lineup, and they need a goaltender to step up. That, that what I would say, is the biggest keys if they're going to end up taking the California burrito, as you put it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think uh, even you mentioned guys that are injured. Even the Classic's got injured, but he's, he's not playing well. So uh, they really are struggling on defense. When you look at them on paper, at least their offense, they should be, be – uh, uh, I, I would say the best offense in California with the Andrew Kane, Timo Meyer, Hurdle, Banks, Donato. Those guys are talented, and, and even Marlowe's not not fading out, even though he's pretty old. <laughs> he's way old. So uh, I, I'm just as sure as another guy. I, I know they miss Pavelski, but uh, yeah, you're right. If they tighten up their defense and get Dubnik in there with some more home games, I, I see them challenging for California Green. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be an interesting task for them because they got guys, some guys that look better eyesight-wise in the bottom six than they do than the guys you expected. Like, I would say Donato has actually looked better than Meyer this four. Even though he's a minus five, that's because of his line mates and being with some guys that are still figuring out the lead. The, the same um, goes with a Ferraro who's listed as a minus four, but that's because of the people he's partnered with. I would actually say, which should not be the case, the 22-year-old Mario Ferraro has been the most consistent defender. I honestly think this guy's looking around going, what the hell is going on? Like, like Vince Lombardi, what the hell is going on out here? Like, because you should He did, I don't think he expected to get a full-time job and be like, yeah, you're playing 22 to 25 minutes a night. Be the saving grace of this team. And it's like, excuse, excuse me? <laughs> like, like that's, um, that's pretty much the position he's in right now. Uh, Kuznov, honestly has played all right in 14 games. He's at a zero, but he's more of a guy that's supposed to, he's not going to help you on the other end. He has two assists, but he's more of a guy that you picked up on draft and you think can help you defensively. But your two 22-year-olds should not be the two guys that I'm complimenting the most on your team. That's when you know you have a defensive issue there. So that's another thing that they're going to have to fix going forward. Maloche, who I said shouldn't be uh, playing as much as he is. At least he's looked good in the two games he has also at 23. That's the thing. For some reason, the Sharks are best defensemen of the guys that shouldn't be the best defensemen yet. 23-year-old looked good in two games as far. The 22-year-old Kuznov looked good in 14 so far. And then Ferrar looked good in 14. Burnsy back and forth. Vlasic's been pretty bad all year, like you said. And then Gleason's Gleason. Gleason's an extra defenseman. So um, they – and then Carlson went in, has not looked like Eric Carlson remotely. So – and he's coming back from an injury, but at the same time, there's other guys like, for example, Gosses Bear in Philly that came back from leg injuries. It looks like he has his legs back under him now. For some reason, Carlson is still playing catch up and it, he needs to get there quick. Otherwise, I think his time in San Jose, if they can find a way to get out of that contract, probably ain't going to be to the end of that contract. Oh, yeah, that's going to be tough. I mean, he, Carlson's been recovering from an injury. Against Ottawa, and he looked great. But he had an Achilles that he was playing through, and since then, moving on to San Jose, he's never he hasn't looked like like old Carlson back that we got from Ottawa since then. So yeah, I I don't know how San Jose gets out of uh, gets out of Carlson's contract. That's going to be a real it's going to be a problem. 
Yeah, it's going to be hard for them. I mean, Eric Carlson gets a big. He's at 11-5. That's one of the biggest defensive cap hits. So I also think we're going to move into this team now for the segue. If the Kings want to trade Drew Doughty just because of how they both look, you have a better chance of having someone take Doughty's salary than you do Carlson's. Because even though he makes a couple mistakes on the defensive end, at least he still puts up the high notch offensive numbers, which I can deal more with you making a couple mistakes if you have 12 points in 14 games. If you have like four to six, that's not really a thing that I'm going to tolerate you making boneheaded mistake in the defensive zone. But I will say one of my favorite defensemen in hockey now is uh, from covering the Kings for overtime, Roy. I mean, Roy's not a guy that's going to do the sexiest things on the ice by any stretch of the imagination. He's a guy that just does it right, does what you need to get done, and is not afraid to really take on anybody. He's only 6'1", 200 pounds. I mean, that's kind of big, but that's not huge compared to other defensemen. And he's not afraid to block a shot, go in front, take on people. Um, that's the, really the main reason Austin Strong's in their, in their um, line with people out, because he's a big guy that actually is able to kind of be the hag or the um, – or like the Sherratt esque guy in your lineup that's more of the block shots physical to Gudis, I guess, is a guy like that too, to a better degree. Um, but like that's the reason he's in your lineup. But yeah, Matt Roy is a guy that just continues to impress me uh, on the defensive end. And he chips in when he chips in on the offensive end, he looks like he's perfectly fine. It's just that's not his game fully to chip in consistently there so he doesn't always do it but he can make the passes he can do it it's just, if you told him to be more aggressive there he probably would put up some points but it's just that's not you don't want to push him away from his uh comfortability yeah and i think i think really that is the advantage kind of talking about their rival the king's rival uh and the sharks rival the ducks is that they haven't seen those injury issues that the, that the sharks and the kings have had so you mentioned roy being in there but uh, is he is he injured or is he? Is he, he came back last night. He will. He was in the four uh, nothing quick shutout. Yeah. He's just getting back. We mentioning Sean Walker being. In. So they've got some guys who are out and Olada not playing great. Uh, I'm excited to see how Bjornfoot plays. I mean, he was got got a point in two games in his bar for the King. So, uh, right? Does he? Yeah, he's yeah he's got a point in two games. He's actually looked pretty good because they've been playing him. I thought he would be more around like ten to thirteen to ease him in, and they're like, "No, oh, we're going to give you seventeen to eighteen minutes." And I'm like, "Oh, okay," but it was it was worth it because when you watched him, he kind of I think it was more. He probably went in thinking twelve to thirteen, and McClellan went, "Well, there's no way in hell I'm not playing this guy four to five more minutes with how he's playing. I'm not going to put an Oli Mata over him." So let, let me uh, put him in more and see what the kid can do. But, yeah, at 19 years old, doing what he's doing, uh, that's pretty darn impressive stepping in and already outplaying a guy that's been in the league for years on end in Oimata. So that's the big reason why I said when I said before the video, I think Oimata needs to take it here is because pretty soon, if you don't step up for guys when guys are out, you're going to eventually have to either go back to Finland or go to some other league and try to reprove yourself overseas and come back years down the line. And that ain't the easiest thing to do. Not many guys do end up coming back. I mean, we saw Kovalchuk, but Kovalchuk was a star. So, like, you know, like that's completely different if you come back in that degree. We saw Pooley Arvey go over and then come back, but that was for maturity issues to mature and develop his game. That's completely different than... Amada, unless if it is all maturity things with him, and then that's you have to go over, you can come back at 28 and you get your head on straight, but that's not the sense I get with him. I think it's more accepting coaching and also just relaying, like act, taking the message that was relayed to you and doing it on the ice rather than just saying, yep, 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 and then not doing half of the things that anybody told you to do. <laughs> that's more what um I think he's at at this point, but... Uh, the Kings, for them, I think, uh, obviously, they play Pedersen one more game than Quick, which is the team that actually has made the most sense, I think, with their goaltending, because they went Quick is struggling a little bit, but we've also hung him out to dry. He's looked good in certain games. Let's play him against opponents we think or take advantage of. He got a shutout on his birthday, so it was nice to see him get put in for his birthday and get a shutout a couple weeks ago. Um, and then he got a shutout last night against Minnie, so... Who's a solid team, obviously haven't played as much in a while, but is a solid team, obviously in itself, has a potential rookie of the year in Caprice. So 
I think um, if you can get quick going, obviously shutting out Minnesota is a good way to get him fully going. He has a 3-4-2, 8-8-7, and is 3-2, where Pedersen has been one of the better statistical guys. He's just 2-4 and four because of the team. 2-4-9 and a 9-2-6. So that's one of the better statistical guys in his first eight games of the season. I would say roll with him as a starter. Let Quick be the nice um, mentor backup that really helps him. And I think that's your best strategy there. If they want to come up and be the team, but they also need other guys to produce in their actual uh, top quarter. Their top two lines have actually been doing really well. But once you go below that, um, you once you go to the fourth line, really, that's where you have to see, like, they have Lias Anderson at fourth line center. He's been complimented by Todd, but he still has to show more consistency. I understand his work ethic and all that, that McClellan compliments, but the work ethic has to turn into like actual action and production on the ice. You can't just keep saying, well, that's a great work ethic. It's kind of like that guy Pirlo brought up where they had an old goalie back in Edmonton or back years ago where it's like, well, he's a great guy. We all love him. He's great in the room. It would just be fantastic if he could stop pucks. It's like, well, that's a little bit of an issue. Like, like he's a great guy in the room. We love him. But if he could just play hockey, that would be great. Like, you need to actually see him translate it. What were you saying? Like, uh, like Rossico. I think it was Red Light Rossico or whatever his name was. Yeah, yeah, I believe that's who it was. Yeah. Well, Huso's kind of like that in St. Louis now. They keep talking. He's a great guy. Bennington loves him. He's great behind Bennington. He gets put in the game and gives up six. And it's like, well... You might want to actually, if you want to win the cup against St. Louis, have a guy that's a little bit more consistent in your backup role and not just a guy that Jordan Bennington is BFFs with. But, you know, that's a different story for a different time. But Bennington's feeding him drinks at the hotel bar. Yeah. Say, yeah, have another. You, 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 you probably won't start tomorrow. It'll be me. Just have another one. Then he's all out in the ice, like, sucking it up, and he's like, Bennington's just going. <laughs> yeah, Bennington actually, though, has showed some more maturity this year, which is good because that's been his big thing. He's been, he had a very Hoshik esque personality while not being Dominic Hoshik. So that's, yeah, that's uh, something he has been able to fix and uh, get back to kind of just getting his head on straight. But before we move on to the Ducks, I will shout out one, uh, one more group of people for the Kings. Once they put them together, Anderson Dolan. Moore, who's kind of been around and hasn't figured it out for yet, has looked pretty good for the Kings, especially assist total. We got a goal last night. And then Grundstrom um, has four points in 12 games, has actually been that nice guy to add that the guys they picked up um, have actually mixed in well with this team, other than Elias Anderson, who's still trying to figure it out. But other than him, the guys they picked up have actually mixed in pretty well. And Mikey Anderson is a guy they keep pushing to develop into their next, I believe, Walker-esque guy that they turn into from getting drafted at 103 to being a guy that by the time it's all said and done, maybe people go, oh, we should draft this guy in the second round. But you don't know if the Kings or if you would have developed him that good. The Kings have been pretty successful uh, with their defense and finding guys later and turning them into guys that are, are pretty darn consistent, like Roy, who was picked 194. But we can uh, move into the um, Ducks now if you want to. And I'm sure one guy you definitely want to highlight on the Ducks is uh, Maxime Kumtraj, if I'm not mistaken, was playing roller hockey in the offseason to uh, to stay in shape with guys. I saw him shirtless on the beach, like, playing <laughs> with guys there. That was pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah, Kumtraj, I, I, at the beginning of the season, we had a roundtable for the hockey writers. And one of the questions was, who, which Ducks player is fly, flying under the radar? Most. And I picked Comtois just because I love his game. He's nothing fancy. He's forward, backwards. He can play both ways. He can cover great defensive zone player, great ahead speed. But the best thing about his game that I think very few Ducks he knows his way around the front of the net and the offensive. He can, he's very elusive in terms of notice a lot of the goals he scored. Kind of watching his, his teammates cycle the puck in the opposite end of the offensive zone. Kind of a wide little turn away from the net, and all of a sudden he's right back there and the defenseman has lost him. And then he can then he can make those shots. Once he gets those passes from his he can really put them in the corners. He can put them low. He gets good on him. So Tomtua has has really uh, not, a, not a fancy skill set, but one the Ducks need to badly. And, and I love that about him. He's, he's a great player. And now that he's on the line with, with Helen Lundestrom, look out, because that, that combination has looked great since they put him together in the Kings. 
they've been a little inconsistent in the defensive zone sometimes, but for the most part, they have been the best line the Ducks have had. And I think if they can keep that, that chemistry going, keep that offensive zone, I, the Ducks are going to be a lot better. <laughs> yeah, and that's good for Raquel, too, because Raquel, um, before they put him there, was not looking like the normal Raquel, where, as you said, taking off with a comptoise on his line, Ludestrom is a guy that I also, like, only 21 years old, so going to get much better as time goes on as well. Um, you have them, and the thing with Comtois that I really like to see was perseverance, because he got really hot, fell off a little bit for a couple games, and got hot again. That's really good to see for a 22-year-old, to be able to show your perseverance and fight. What do you think about that? Yeah, and that's that's not something that's been uh, simply this season or on a game-to-game basis. Dealt with that basically his whole career in Anaheim. I mean, his first two years ago, he came up, made the team out of, uh, there were some injuries, so he made the team out of training camp for the fastest goal to start his career, and I think to start a game in Ducks history, four goals after that. Had a, had a pretty productive season, but uh, I think Murray was trying to keep him out of the expansion draft and didn't trying to keep him out of that 10-game limit that, that those young players have. So he didn't really get a lot of NHL time, spent that season. And then last year, really didn't get as much of an opportunity as you would have thought considering how he played the year before. He played well, scored some goals, got some points, just some limited time that he had, but was not was not given as much of an opportunity on it. Uh, I'm just guessing on that. He <laughs> a little story. I don't know. I don't know really what to make of this. But last year, uh, Nicholas Deloria, who was playing a lot, got in a lot of fights, which is great. I mean, he's a good player. I tweeted out, uh, Nicholas Deloria knows why he's in the lineup because it had been like the third game in a row he'd fought, and Max Comtois liked it. And I was like, <laughs> well, I was trying to interpret what that meant, but I, I think it was probably a supportive thing. Like this guy, this guy has has a, a role in the lineup, but at the same time, that was when he was in the NHL or not playing. And I was like, he's a little bitter that he's not playing, uh, and he showed that he deserves it. And I, I like that little bit of an attitude that he's got, and and the uh, confidence, obviously the leadership ability. So he's a, he's a strong, I think, a strong presence with the Ducks, both on the ice and off the ice. Yeah, well, speaking, you brought up Delorier, who fights a lot as the aggressiveness, but also has five points this year and three goals and two assists. What have you thought of him actually starting the season off, actually getting on the score sheet? Yeah, it's. I mean, that, that, that's not really an anomaly either. He he got hot at the end of last year, got his first career hat trick in the in the final game before the pandemic or the one before. Uh, and Dallas Eakins loves that fourth line. That fourth line, much to the chagrin of a lot of Ducks Twitter. Starts games, plays a lot. Some of the guys play on the power play. A lot of them play on the on the. Yeah, play. Grant gets power play time, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's it's just weird, and, and I think people cite their their advanced statistics. They don't like. They don't think they're that solid in defense. But listen, they bring energy to the ice. They bring scoring opportunities. The Ducks need that energy and that life. I mean, more than anything else, they play so inconsistent, about flat footed. If you have those guys starting a game. That's pretty much your only option. And now that Lundestrom and Raquel and, and Tom Tua are, are playing better, you like to see them get some more ice time, which they've been getting. But uh, that fourth line with Delorier, those guys, those guys really do bring value to the team, though it might not be on an advanced basis. Yeah, I mean, Grant, before the layoff, which you can't, I, the, last year was such a weird year. I don't bl- blame too much guys that came back and struggled after the layoff. Before the layoff, when the Flyers got him, he was that energy spark. He actually really did help the team and provide a lot for the team. Then he struggled a bit in the return, but, I mean, he wasn't Nate Thompson, let's put it that way, where he actually still uh, provided energy and still did some things, and you still saw the normal Grant. Going back there did make sense for me in the offseason. Once I saw him going back to the Ducks, I'm like, ooh, that's a good, nice little small re-pickup for them because he has, uh, he's been there, he knows them, and uh, he's going to be able to kind of just jump back in and almost say, I was on the gone for a couple months, guys. Hey, I'm back. Um, like, like almost like that Seinfeld thing where you just see them like <laughs> dancing at the door. Like it's like that thing almost. He's used to it. That's his Third time coming back to the Ducks after after being I think he left once maybe as a free agent and then got traded and traded back for him so he's been off out of Anaheim and back in Anaheim three times so it's uh it's definitely a familiar experience definitely shows they like him too he's Bob Murray <laughs> yeah but uh, well, yeah I mean the Ducks I think they're 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 a hard team to they're a hard team to peg in terms of, uh talking about another player who big signing in the offseason, Shattenkirk, 
he struggled too. People people are talk talk about how he he's a net gain in terms of what he can generate offensive opportunities, but he's supposed to be their power play quarterback and he's co leading the team with Hampus Lindholm in penalty minutes. You don't want to see a guy who's supposed to be on the ice generating power play chances, causing your team to get penalty kills. He struggled a lot, and I think that's definitely hurt the Ducks because power play has uh, – it's just it, it's something that you think it'll work out of, but you also wonder playing in Tampa behind Sergeyev and, and Edmund and with that talented offensive uh, group, like you wonder if he, if he isn't the guy anymore that can kind of lead an offense, maybe complimentary. That's another issue that – Yeah. Um, as we wrap up uh, here with our two final points with defense, uh, Manson is, I want to say, six weeks, six weeks, six weeks, six weeks, it says expected duration. And then you have a uh, Goulet, who's obviously a solid youngster that didn't get to play yet due to his MCL issue. Um, what do you feel of guys? Hudden came over from the Kings, just went right down the interstate. Pretty easy for him. Um, and then you got. Honkapa, who's probably playing a little bit of extra minutes because of the guys that are out. Larson, what do you think of the guys that have been put in, and who do you think stepped up the most out of that group? Uh, Honkapa and Larson are two big ones. Hutton's always consistent there. He, I think he's still getting his legs under him. He had a good start, but he, he you don't really notice him that much. But people love Honkapa's physicality. He's not a puck mover. He's not an offensive guy, but he brings physicality in the defense. Larson really impressed me up until the last few games. He's moved the puck. He's getting involved in the offense a little. I really think, and Larson was a whipping boy of Ducks fans because last year, probably year, it's been Larson, Mahura, and Gould that were kind of competing for a uh, for that last that sixth spot in the Ducks lineup. Larson got it last year, and he's kind of criticizing Bob Murray and and Dal Keegan putting in the lineup so much, but. Larson this year has stepped up. I think he does. It. Maybe you might see Josh Mahura now uh, that Larson bit more, but I, I've been impressed with Larson. Hockenpah was a, was a pickup. Obviously, on a, a better team, you're not going to see those guys make as much impact. But uh, for the Ducks, those are those. Are some- yeah, no, that's for sure. Yeah, I was just wanting to get you taken that because I know Hockenpah. I see a lot of stuff on social media. How much guys love him, which I do too. I'm old school in hockey. I don't. I I love to see the guys that you don't want to meet in a dark alley. He definitely fits that description. I would not want to meet a six five, two hundred and twenty pound man in a dark alley. That's as physical as a uh, Yanni Hockenpah and probably a Finnish warrior. So uh, yeah, I, I definitely definitely do not want to meet him there. But as our closing point, you can't talk about the Ducks without talking about John Gibson. Uh, John Gibson, uh, you said it, and I probably honestly agree with it. You're on a team like this, you're probably, you, I think you're the best goalie in the NHL if you're putting up a 2 221, a 921, and a 233 goals again. Uh, you're on a team that's still trying to figure it out and has been dysfunctional at times on defense. The fact that you're able to still do that, would you say he's the best guy still in the league or up there? Yeah, it's it's such a hard thing to judge with him because he is one of the best. I, th- I think if you had a team where you know what you were getting in a consistent night to night, you know, he would be a lot better maybe. There are rumors that his mental state is struggling a little bit, just frustration where they're going. There's, or I think, Joe Murphy or Boston Hockey now of all places uh, reported the other day that there, there were some rumors that he, was, he and his agent were looking to get out of town. I don't know if that's true. I understand it is true. Uh, Pittsburgh not doing great, but they're probably a little better than the Ducks are. So uh, it's interesting. I if I really think that he he has the tools to continue to be an elite goaltender. I'm sure he's exhausted, both mentally and physically. Yep. Out basis, some nights. I mean, <laughs> none of us, neither of us, are NHL or professional hockey players. You've had those days at work where you just come in and you're like. Like, yep. This yeah. me, and you're like, and you just don't perform well. And it's it's not really a reflection on your skills or your ability level. It's just you've had it with with or you're struggling, and and I think that's that might be kind of Deshaun Watson with a Houston type thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think I think Gibson is is one of the best goalies if he ever ever does. <laughs> Wow, I've got marbles in my mouth. If he ever does uh, end up playing for a more competitive team, or if the Ducks end up improving on in the defensive zone and cutting down on the opportunity, 
really going to see Gibson play, especially if you give Miller a few more opportunities. Yeah, you can't um, run your goalie, even if he is one of the best. You shouldn't be running him to the ground, especially when you have a veteran in Ryan Miller. I mean, I would be saying you guys got to play. Like, when the, when Miller gets in, the defense just looks worse. Like, like I would just be if, – like, if I'm the coach, I'm calling I'm, – if I'm Ekins, I'm saying, hey, everybody, pick it up. You got your backup in. You're supposed to pick it up with the backup and not play less. <laughs> like, like, come on, let's go. Um, like – that's what most other teams do. You see it with uh, look at the stars when they had to put in Hudobin last year for their run. They did. They played their best hockey in years, let alone last year, because they actually finally committed to offense and didn't go. We have two goal lead. Let's just play defense the rest of the. Game. So like that. Um, that showed, and I think uh, giving them rest definitely will help. Obviously, you also have um, Dostal, who's consistently been one of the better AHL guys. I know our announcers. Sh- um, and the announcer of the goal shouted him out. And I think even our announcer talked about him for no reason whatsoever when I was watching the one game. Um, so, like, there's a lot of stuff good about him. He gets talked about when he doesn't even need to be talked about because of how good he's playing in the AHL by other announcers. So I think he's a guy you could move forward with. It's just if you think your rebuild is only going to take another one to two years, you might not want to trade John Gibson, even though I am high on Dossel just because he's John Gibson. It's a little bit of a different degree. He's John Gibson. Dostal, I think, is going to be very good, but I don't know if he's going to be John Gibson. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to hurry. I don't think you have to hurry if you're the Ducks either because you've got Gibson under contract. As much as he might maybe allegedly is thinking about wanting to leave town, Dostal, you've got him in the AHL. You've got Miller for one more season. I, I, as opposed to Trevor Zegers and, and uh, Drysdale and some of the guys forwards and defensemen the Ducks have in San Diego, Irvine right now because that's where they're playing, uh, I think you don't have to rush Dostal. I'd like to see those other guys up and get a chance in the NHL, but I think you give Miller his last season, let him retire, bring Dostal up behind Gibson, and not worried about Gibson contract running out or anything like that. So that's the one guy, Dostal, that I don't hurry into the NHL. I let him dominate the NHL and give him that confidence. To- I agree. I think goalies, uh, you do want to, um, you have to call it at the time when it's right. You can't. You can't rush a goalie up, otherwise you're just gonna have you're gonna screw the development a bit and then have to revert back and then get it back to where you want it to be. You have to be careful. It's like the quarterbacks. You don't want to rush a quarterback to start when he's behind somebody, otherwise you might screw up his development rather than help it. But um as we're hitting, as Pirlo would say, the great Pirloism are full forty two here. Uh do you have any closing points you want to say on the three California teams, Deli? No, I think look out. I think San Jose is going to get better as, as they start to play more home games. I think the Ducks, just inconsistency is killing them. I'd love to see them uh, just play a 60-minute game for a couple games in a row just to get maybe a winning streak going, which is something they haven't really done all year. Kings, uh, good luck. Bring up, just give Byfield and Bjornfoot and Ka- Kaliev, those guys, a chance to get a few games under their belt in the NHL and see if that doesn't help you guys, help, help them because – I know they're not defensemen. They're struggling. Bjornfoot is. They're struggling more on the defensive end. But I want to see that young generation of both Kings and Ducks players come up and start to. Yeah, and Kaliev, when he had to come up just to, just due to a forced thing, scored. <laughs> so, I mean, he already showed the ability to crash the net and score and has looked good in the minors. So I think, yeah, he's definitely ready. He's looked good for the rain. you got to be able to um, call a guy when he's ready, even if he is young and still – Smart players, we talked about this with your reef yesterday. This should be my closing point in the uh, nitty gritty pocket. Smart guys get called up before they're physically ready. They don't, you don't always wait till they're physically ready because they're just so smart. You know, they're going to figure out how to not get themselves injured and just get to the right spot. Kaliev's one of those people. He's a very smart, intelligent player that can get called up before because he's not fully physically ready yet for the league. He's a very young kid, but next season he will be because he'll do what others have done. Comtois did it in the past. He kept building up strength. And uh, obviously, it's hilarious that he plays raw hockey. But it's also a great strategy um, because I, I I play pickup raw hockey. That is a good way to stay in shape. You get gassed when you're playing on a full rink and trying to keep up with people. So that is a good way to do that in the offseason, especially during COVID. But that would be my closing point. You got to call guys that are the brilliant, the guys that think it with the mind and don't use all their skill to get everything done. They can come up early. 
because they're going to be able to figure it out. And he's one of those smart guys. So I would definitely agree with you on that. But I thank you uh, for joining and making time today, Delhi. You can follow him at Delhi Tweets on Twitter and me at JJBoard26. This has been the Sports Fanatic News. California hockey check-in. Who's going to win the California burrito at the end of the season? Like, comment, and subscribe, and let us know in the comments. Have a great, safe, and pleasant day, everybody, and enjoy all the great hockey action. Peace out.